This fresh coat of the startup life has been sprayed on nice and smooth by Wagner and the Flexil series of paint sprayers. Startup Nation, my wife decided she wanted to rehab her childhood home. The goal was to fix it up and invite a nice family to rent it out. We knew one of the biggest jobs we had to undertake was painting. However, from the walls, the cabinets, and even the siding outside, it was going to be a big task. As entrepreneurs with a company to run, we knew this was going to take up a lot of our time, which is why we decided to get a paint sprayer. And after much research, we decided to go with the sprayer from the Flexio series from Wagner. Startup Nation, these sprayers are top-notch because of its flexibility to paint or stain walls, furniture, cabinets, and more. It's 10 times faster than using a paintbrush, which was a big selling point for us. And you can paint or stain right from the can. It's also easy to clean in five minutes and being great for indoor and outdoor projects, a paint sprayer from the Flexio series clearly needs to be part of the arsenal in your garage. So if you're ready to stain your deck or like me, feel your daughter's request of a bubblegum pink room, up your game with a paint sprayer from the Flexio series by Wagner. Take it from me. Your time will thank you. It's time to be about that life, the startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation, so I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, as entrepreneurs, professional development is the name of the game. And with many of us working from home, you may find yourself with a little more time in your hands to do just that. But what does that look like in the era of COVID, and how do you maximize what you are learning? Well, we have an amazing guest to help us out with just that. She is an internationally recognized thought leader who creates brain science-based solutions for today's challenges. As the CEO of Seventh Mind, she creates brain science-based solutions for Fortune 100 companies like Comcast and Apple, and also Ernst & Young, Microsoft, Domino's, and more. She is the former chief learning officer at Forlinda.com and the senior learning consultant for global leadership and talent development at LinkedIn. She's also the author of the Wired 2 series books on the brain on the brain science of success. She is Dr. Britt Andriata. Dr. B, how are you? I'm great, Dominic. How are you this morning? I am living a dream. I can't complain. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show today. We really appreciate your time uh, and your expertise that you're going to bring to our audience. We're definitely looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. I'm always excited to connect with new listeners, and I'm lo- I'm really happy to be connecting with your audience. For sure, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. So I kind of gave you an uh, 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 introduction about who you are and and, and uh, your expertise and stuff like that. But who is Dr. B? Kind of tell us who you are and your origin story a little bit, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to share. <laughs> well, if you look through my whole career, I've always been someone who's cared about like helping people be better mm-hmm. at whatever they want to be better at. So I really believe that we all have a lot of potential inside of us. And sometimes we just need a little help, you know, getting a boost to that potential. So I've always been kind of in learning, education, leadership development, and it was in my role at Chief Learning Officer at Lynda.com, which mm-hmm. is now LinkedIn Learning, right. that I st- – and I have a PhD, but it's not in neuroscience. But I started studying neuroscience because I just wanted to be better at my craft. Right. So I started looking at, you know, how does the brain learn? And that ended up turning into my first book. And then link, uh, LinkedIn acquired Lynda.com. Right. And that's when I wrote my second book on the brain science of change. And then I was like, oh, I guess this is what I'm doing now. I'm doing <laughs> books on the brain science of stuff. Gotcha. So my third book was about uh, teams and collaboration and how we bring it, bring out the best in groups. So that's kind of what I do now is I, I go back to the literature and I see – what neuroscientists are finding out about this amazing body we inhabit every day. And, um, and then bringing that as practical, actionable things we can all do in our lives to help us be better at whatever we're trying to achieve. Cause we each have our own individual goals, but whatever we're shooting for, we always have untapped potential that could be boosted a little bit with the right information or skills. 
Gotcha. I, I appreciate all of that. And Startup Nation, if you want to check out uh, those books, we have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you're listening to the replay uh, on the podcast. Now, Dr. B, I'm curious about something because I imagine that we all learn differently. So how do we figure out you know, how we learn differently and how do we maximize uh, that uh, learning so that way we can kind of uh, not only maximize our learning, but kind of maximize our craft, maximize our business or whatever the case may be? Yeah, so there's a couple of things we know about the biology of learning. Mm -hmm. And one is that when we're taking information in, excuse me, I've got a cough here. Sure, no worries. Excuse me. So we've learned a lot about how the brain learns. And when we're taking in information, we really need to focus because our working memory is what's taking in that information. And it has to have kind of a clear recording, if you will, to push it into long-term memory. So when you're learning, give yourself the gift of focus. Don't be multitasking and trying to answer your emails or manage something else because you really want to have, you know, as clear of data as you can. And we know that the human attention span really only can focus for about 20 minutes maximum. Mm. So I really believe in learning in small bursts and then just doing some kind of short processing activity, whether that's just jotting down a few notes or talking with a partner and sharing what you learned or applying it to your own real life situation. And then after you've done just a really brief processing activity that, that helps the hippocampus, that's the part of the brain that, that forms memories. It helps it push it into long-term memory and then you're ready to go again. So I really encourage people to do these this micro learning, but then you can string a whole bunch of them together to be a half day experience or something like that. And then with memory, the trick is getting it back out of your memory again. They're called retrievals. Mm. So if you want to learn, you want to test yourself a little bit, like with flashcards or just sharing the information with another person. Every time you go back into your memory and you retrieve or you pull back that information, it's what strengthens it. It turns out there's a magic number. Scientists have found that it's three retrievals spaced with sleep in between. So Mm. whether you do one a week or one every other day, testing yourself that way is what really boosts your memory capacity. And then if we're talking about behavior change, and and I work with a lot of organizations on on professional development and and helping professionals continue to grow their skills, you know, behavior change is what it's all about. And now we're getting into habits. And it turns out that if you want to change a behavior, you know, the old adage used to be 21 days. It's really 40 to 50 repetitions Mm. to form a new habit so that it's autopilot. So if you happen to do something twice a day, then yeah, you're around 21 days. But uh, you can also really front load and do a bunch of repetitions in in short order. And then you can accelerate your, your journey toward getting that behavior to be more automatic. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. And I appreciate what you said about, you know, uh, uh, having that process with a partner, if you will. You know, it's funny because my first sergeant back uh, when I was in the army used to say that you you don't know what you know until you can teach it to somebody else. And so now that's kind of ringing back in my head when you said that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whenever we have to turn around and tell somebody else, it forces us to make sure that we know it. And then we're using our own words, we're retrieving it from our memory, we're, we're connecting it to this social experience we're having. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of things that happen in the body when we do that. So your sergeant was smart. He knew exactly what boosts learning. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know, we may have had some words after that, but I guess he may have been right about that. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's another story for another day, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so, but no, I appreciate you sharing that. But I wanted to talk about, you talked about that behavior change, because that can sometimes be difficult. I know you talked about the repetitions, but what if I hit that 40 to 50 repetitions and for some reason I fall off the wagon or it's just not you know, catching, is there something else I can do after that? Cause I know for a lot of people, even including myself, that part can be a bit difficult. Yeah. So, you know, typically when we're forming a new behavior, a couple of things, what researchers have found that forms a habit is first of all, there's the cue, the mm. thing that tells us it's time to do this behavior. So if it's using software, it's when you log into your computer, if it's driving, it's when you get into the car. And then we go into the routine, which is all those little acts that make up the behavior, you know, stepping on the gas, changing the gear, you know, double clicking on icons, opening files. Um, That's the routine. And then when we're forming a new habit, 
the brain needs a reward mm. in order for it to see that this behavior is worth doing. Gotcha. So when we were teenagers and we were learning to drive, we had the reward of getting where we wanted to go or freedom, you know, getting away right. from our parents. Right. When we use software, you know, even if, if it's annoying, like when they change software on you and it's frustrating at first, it's because you already had a habit that made it easy and now you're having to think about it. But every time you successfully log in and get your work done, you get a reward. So how you can help yourself is, first of all, like, you know, diet and exercise is something a lot of us want to be better at. If you give yourself a small reward for doing the behavior you want to do, it will help the brain form the habit. Now, you don't have to give yourself a reward forever just at that beginning stage, and then you can take the reward away because you've gotten over the hump. Mm. And, you know, that's that 40 to 50 repetitions is an average. Gotcha. So some people will go faster and some people will go slower. But, for example, you know, I used to be a professor, and mm. we would log in and use the online system to submit grades once every three months. And I never did it often enough for it to become a habit because I would get it done and then I wouldn't do it for three months. And so the next time I had to do it, it was frustrating. I'd have to look up all the, you know, the, the, the guides they sent us and the screenshots for how to do it. So part of it is also, you know, doing them close enough together that you can get over that hump. You know, this pandemic is a perfect example. Absolutely. You know, at first, you know, wearing our masks or washing our hands for 20 seconds was new behavior. But we were forced to do it enough times that now we don't even have to think about some of these behaviors. They've just become habits. Right. And you know, the reward was not getting sick for us in this particular moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but whenever you're trying to learn something for yourself, like I worked with an executive who was trying to change a behavior, and he bought a jar and put a whole bunch of M&Ms in the jar. And every time he did the behavior right, he gave himself an M&M. And he put 50 M&Ms in the jar so he could kind of keep track of where he was on it. So you can do things to kind of make this more fun or help yourself learn. Gotcha. So I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to say tricking the brain, but but I, I can definitely see that reward system uh, to kind of you know. Uh, re reaffirm or re you know uh, re, like you said reward the uh, the person to kind of for that new behavior. So I appreciate you sharing that. And you talked about COVID. You know what does professional development look like? Like let's say I'm a small business owner and I'm trying to lead a team through Zoom and stuff like that. You know are there any you know uh, challenges or things we should consider as we're leading our team during COVID when we're trying to do that professional development? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm going to break it into phases. Sure. You know, at first, when everything was first happening, it was new for everyone. Right. So breaking things down and showing people how to use Zoom and giving people permission to make mistakes and kind of learning together. Um, you know, whenever we're kind of introducing a new and disruptive behavior, the more we can provide guidance and support and encouragement is really helpful. Now, at this point in time, you know, we're six to eight months into this lockdown experience. People are truly exhausted now. Right. What, what, what research shows is that when the disaster hits of any kind, humans have this incredible ability to kind of lean in. It's called your surge capacity. And it's what gets people through the aftermath of a hurricane or uh, a fire or some disaster. Like you can just, even though you're exhausted, you can just keep digging deep and making it through. But what we know is that that surge capacity kind of gets depleted at around six months after the initial event. And this is what's hard for all of us around the world right now is that it's not ending, and yet our surge capacity is depleted. So right now at this point in time, we're at the end of October that we're doing this call, people are truly hitting that exhaustion point. Right. So right now, it's not a great time to ask people to learn new behaviors right now. People Mm. are exhausted. They're probably a little more cranky and uh, more emotional and more, you know, like I'm crying more right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people are snappier right now. So right now is a time to just lean into self-care and give people a chance to just kind of um, just manage their time and take some things off their plate to kind of get through this depletion, this exhaustion phase. And gotcha. then we can start to add add things again. But right now, I would say add things with – if you're going to add something, do it with a lot of support and encouragement and kindness. And then, you know, as we move into the next phase, um, 
you know, people always have to learn. So the more we can provide guidance and support, the more we can show people. We have this thing called mirror neurons where we uh, it drives observational learning. So if you can ever make a video of something or have photos of it wherever people can use that visual um, thing that, you know, we can observe somebody do the behavior correctly, that can really help people learn as well. Gotcha. You know, it's funny. My wife is an educator uh, as well, and she always used to talk about this thing called the effective filter. And it sounds like that exhaustion part is like that effective filter where it's like, you know, we're we're not, not really I'm not really here to learn something new right now. I got a lot going on. I got, you know, virtual learning with my kids. I got this. I got that. So now I can definitely understand that for sure. Yeah. But I would say, you know, I've been hearing that recruiters are starting to ask people who are applying for jobs, mm. hey, how did you use this COVID time to improve yourself? Gotcha. And, um, you know, that, that's a hard question to ask people. Some people are just surviving, right? right. Or some people were dealing with the loss of a loved one or right. managing working from home with kids. So I think it's an unfair question. If I could advise the mm. the hiring, <laughs> the recruiting industry, I'd say, hey, that's not a, exactly a fair question to ask, but people should be prepared to answer it. Definitely. So you should think about what does that mean to you? I don't think you need to run through a list of all the courses and certifications you completed, but if you did that, awesome. Um, if you didn't do that, you know, be prepared to answer how you were proactively taking care of yourself or why you didn't have the time to invest in something like that. Um, for many people, you know, we were in survival mode and survival mode takes up a ton of energy. Gotcha. I know. I definitely understand that, especially in the entrepreneurial startup culture. We're always talking about, you know, uh, beating the competition and stuff like that. If if you're not if you're not moving forward, you're you're losing and, and stuff like that. So no, you bring up a very uh, very uh, interesting and valid point that like sometimes you need to just just relax and not, well, not necessarily relax, but at the very least, like do that self care uh, that you talked about. And like you shouldn't no no, always be just going, going, going. So I can, I can definitely appreciate that. Thank you so much, Dr. B. Absolutely. And I'm working with a lot of organizations right now, some who are getting opportunities to grow their business, like because of the pandemic, their business is taking off. Right. And yet they're doing surveys with their employees and their employees are saying now, like we're maxed out, you know, our work-life balance is really off. We've been working super hard to pivot and now we're exhausted. And so leaders particularly startup leaders just need to listen to that. You can ask people to sprint for a while, but at some point they have to be able to stop and catch their breath. And if you keep pushing folks, ultimately you may lose some of your best people or people will start to make more mistakes. You know, they're, they're not going to have as good of judgment when they're fatigued. So it's something to pay attention to if you lead others that um, they are kind of hitting their, their max time. They will recover. The human body is amazing and it will recover and become resilient and, and have energy in the future. But it's also okay. <laughs> if you're feeling exhausted, it's, I totally get it. And it's important to, to take care of yourself. And I think that's the challenge. Right now, a lot of the things that we used to do to take care of ourselves, we don't have access to. Right. So we're all being called to like dig deep and find new ways to take care of ourselves. And I think that's where some folks are challenged. It's like, oh, well, I think I'll just open my laptop and keep working because I can't go get that massage or go have dinner with my friends or whatever it is. And yet we do need to have that downtime. It's super important. For sure. For sure. Thank you uh, for sharing that. And, you know, and, and speaking, going back to the kind of the neuroscience part, you know, you, you may be familiar with Elon Musk and he's working with this, uh, this uh, other co-founders with this company, Neuralink, where you basically kind of have like this, I don't know, this neuro- neurological prosthesis in your head and you can like have a flow of information exter- from an external you know, uh, uh, component, you know, to your head. And so we're, you know, ear of like down, literally downloading stuff into our brains. I'm just curious, yep. what is, what's your commentary on that? Is it, is it, is it really cool? Is it like, uh, we're kind of playing with something we may not be dealt, shouldn't be delving into. What's your take on that? Dr. Andriata? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, I just finished watching The Social Dilemma mm, on Netflix a right. couple of days ago. So if, if you haven't watched it, watch it. Because <clears throat> I think they make a really great point, and I believe this too, you know, technology has has evolved already to be beyond what our biology can handle. Mm. Our, our biology has not changed that much in, in hundreds of years. Gotcha. Um, and technology is outstripping it. And so now we have this 
this thing, whatever the thing is, right, whether it's our cell phones or whether it's this new prosthetic device or whatever, technology is outstripping what our biology can handle. So th- there inevitably is a rub there. Mm. And we're all going to have to make thoughtful choices around how we, how much access we want to give ourselves or give that entity to us biologically and what we do to counterbalance it, the effects of it. Um, so whether you're looking at you know, how social media is designed to kind of keep tracking our attention and keep pulling our attention away. And and it's designed to truly be an addictive thing um, to whether you want to sign up to have a device installed or, or linked with you. We're all going to have to make choices. But the bottom line is when machines do the thinking, they do not. AI is never designed to make choices that are in the best interest of human beings. Mm. It's, all AI is designed to keep running its algorithm and, and, and streamlining its algorithm to be faster and more successful at whatever the success parameter is. For most companies, it's making money. Um, that's not necessarily what's in the best interest of, of human beings and what's good for them. So we are seeing, you know, some mental health things directly tied to our use of cell phones and our, our inability to have good boundaries with them. So I would just say for all of us, it's a time to be cautious and mm-hmm. it's a time to do a little exploring of that, of that line. And ultimately it's up to each of us individually to pay attention to what is good for us and to, and to have some boundaries. We're all going to have to have that skill of creating boundaries and sticking to them, even when it's unpopular or difficult. For sure. No, I, I definitely understand that. It's, it's one of those things where I'm kind of, you know, it's like, it sounds extremely cool. But then I'm like, uh, I don't know, man, that sounds like we're kind of not necessarily playing God here, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's tricky terrain is, is what I'm guessing here. So what I'm thinking here. So, but no, I appreciate you sharing that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the other thing that I would say is that technology has the power to be incredibly useful. For like sure. I love having this mini computer in my pocket, right? And right. I can look up a map and I can make an appointment and I can do all this stuff. The problem is when those services on the other end need to make money mm. and how they go about making gotcha. money. So I'm sure this device that Elon Musk has, like I'm a big fan of his work and I think he's a real groundbreaker in so many ways. Right. I'm sure there's elements of it that are going to be hugely, you know, make us even more productive or make our lives easier. The question is that we all have to ask ourselves is how is it monetized? Mm. You know, right. wh- where does the money stream happen on the back? Um that's where that's where the the algorithms can start to not necessarily work in our own best interest. So I would just encourage us all to ask those questions and see see what happens. But yeah, I mean, there's always benefits to some of this technology. We just have to really keep an eye out for what are the potential dangers and be proactive in in protecting ourselves or demanding that these companies do more to protect the humans that use them. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And Startup Nation, when you go to BrittAndriata.com, we have a link there in the show notes for easy access. If you're listening to the replay on the podcast, there's a blog section where uh, Dr. B writes a lot of different uh, pieces on many different topics from uh, brain science to change to leadership. And I actually want to talk to you because you wrote a piece in uh, September 26 about building high performing teams. Just kind of share with us what are some of those things we need to consider as entrepreneurs and small business owners when we're building a team uh, that we're building high performing ones. Great question. So that research all comes from my book called Wired to Connect. Mm-hmm. And some of the key points in it is that, you know, teams, uh, we bring together teams and many teams go on a trajectory of first coming together, then having a little bit of conflict, it's natural and normal, and then kind of settling in and creating their norms and then starting to get into good performance and really starting to be productive and working really well with each other. But not all teams follow that trajectory. Mm. They can also, in those early stages, develop, you know, a lack of trust. They can develop, um, you know, they can exclude each other. They can create negative norms where they're not open and honest and supportive of each other. And then the team is actually on a trajectory to dysfunction. And if they're allowed to stay in dysfunction for very long, they move on to learned helplessness, which is a behavior that is very, very difficult to overcome if people have just essentially given up having any hope. Gotcha. So 
for leaders, you know, how and when you bring teams together is super important. You have to be really careful in those early meetings because biologically what we're sorting for in those early meetings is our sense of safety, both physical safety, but also psychological safety. Can I question, you know, something? Can I share a mistake? Can I uh, bring up an idea without fear of punishment or rejection from the group or the leader? And then we also want to have a sense of purpose. Is what we're being asked to do clear? Can I see how we're going to accomplish it? Can I personally bring my set of strengths to help us achieve this? Meaning, I know biologically I'll be contributing to the tribe and the tribe will see value in my work. Turns out there's a ton of biology inside of us that's part of our tribalness, you know, part of working in groups. We're, we're, we're there to read intention and meaning in each other and know that we can contribute. And we're super sensitive to exclusion because back in our hunter-gatherer days, if the tribe was starting to marginalize us and move us to the edge and, and exclude us and ultimately oust us, we were very we were very much in danger of, of not surviving. So understanding kind of this biology of how we connect with others and the danger of exclusion and why inclusion is so important are really, th- are really important things that leaders need to know. Because once you understand the biology behind it, you're like, oh, okay, I need to make sure that I run meetings in this way mm. or that I really make sure that I'm setting the team up for success by doing X, Y, and Z. So it really gives us kind of a blueprint. Because once we give teams that container that they need early on, then they absolutely move on the path of good norms and great performance. But sometimes, you know, the leader inadvertently sets them on the bad path. So once you kind of know this information, you can consistently create great performing teams again and again. Gotcha. Thank you uh, for sharing that. You know, it's always fascinating to me that like how much we have evolved as a society in a myriad of ways. Uh, there are still just some things at our core. When you talk about the hunter gathered uh, days and stuff like that, where we're still kind of those people just kind of wandering and searching and trying to figure uh, things out. It, it just always fascinates me when, uh, when, when people talk about that for sure. Yeah, I geek out on it all the time. It's why I'm constantly <laughs> researching this stuff and then writing what I'm learning. I find it so fascinating. And really, they're just beginning to understand some aspects of our biology. It's really still a very new field. All right, Startup Nation, so we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. we got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson, and you're listening to The Startup Life. Check it out, Startup Nation. I know many of you are trying to improve your marketing performance, right? You have your business or your e-commerce store, and you're trying to increase that brand awareness. No worries. I got you. You should listen to the brand new Keep Optimizing podcast. That's optimizing with an S and not a Z. It's a marketing podcast that will provide you with not only the latest tips and advice in the game, but also you will hear from experts in their field when it comes to email marketing, SEO, and more. This is a must-listen-to podcast for my e-commerce entrepreneurs. It's hosted by Chloe Thomas, who is a 15-year marketing expert, best-selling author, and award-winning podcast host. It's already a top-20 marketing podcast in seven countries, so clearly you're going to get amazing value every episode. So as you can see, Stoutermation, you're in good hands with my girl, CT. So listen and subscribe to the Keep Optimizing podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you like to get your favorite podcast. You can also get more information at keepoptimizing.com. The link is there in the show notes. Oralex powers this episode of The Startup Life. Startup Nation, as a podcaster, radio host, and business owner, I know a thing or two about the need for your message to come through clearly to your target audience. The last thing you want when trying to close a big deal over the phone or giving a sales presentation in your conference room is to have the person you are talking to be distracted by either the fact that you sound like you're in a warehouse or an outside noise like a fire truck. Trust me, Startup Nation. I know this all too well from experience. And that is why Oralex has your back. Oralex Acoustics creates professionally tested products that you can trust in a commercial space or at home. Better office acoustics improves intelligibility when video conferencing or generic conversation reduces stress and helps build a proactive work atmosphere. 
From a home studio from our content creators to your office space downtown, your gear performs better in an acoustically treated room. Trust me, you are in good hands with Oralex as they are the number one brand in acoustics, providing trusted solutions for over 40 years. Also, you can download the Oralex Acoustic Treatment mobile app in the Apple or Google Play Store to give you specifically designed and instantaneous recommendations for various room types. Go to Oralex.com and use the promo code STARTUP in all caps for 10% off your entire order. The link is there in the show notes if you are listening to the replay on the podcast. So if you are ready to stop sounding like you're having a sales meeting in a sports arena, go with Oralex. Professional audio made simple. Tresta powers this episode of The Startup Life. Okay, Startup Nation, I want to talk to you about our sponsor, Tresta. Tresta is an app for iPhone and Android that lets you do business calling and texting from anywhere. I know so many entrepreneurs that are still using their their personal phone number for business calls. It can get complicated drawing the line between your personal and professional life. Startup Nation, this is the best business phone app out there. Whether you just need a business phone number or if your team is ready for a complete business phone system, Tresta is totally flexible and can grow with your business. And it's all unlimited calling, texting, and all of the powerful call management features like auto attendance, call recording, user groups, and more for just $15 per user per month. With Tresta, there's no contract and you don't need any special hardware, just your smartphone you're already using. Tresta is easy to configure so you can set everything up yourself all online avoiding all the hassle and high overhead costs of setting up a traditional business phone system, which is important because as entrepreneurs, we are always trying to cut cost and time. They're often a 30-day free trial so you can see if Tresta's virtual phone system is right for you. Communicate smarter and more efficiently with Tresta. Start now at Tresta.com forward slash startup life. That's T-R-E-S-T-A dot com forward slash startup life. The link is there in the show notes if you're listening on the podcast. Tresta, business communication simplified. All right, Startup Nation, welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on The Startup Life. Got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. Also, Startup Nation, when you go to uh, the website, BrittAndriana.com, you can check out all of the courses that she has. She has over, you know, her courses have been viewed over 10 million times worldwide and receive top ratings and glowing comments from viewers of all uh, backgrounds. If you would, Dr. B, just kind of share some of the courses that you have and some of the offerings that you have that people can kind of check out. Okay, great. Well, from my own research, you know, I've got my three books, Wired to Grow, which is all about learning, Wired to Resist, which is about change, and Wired to Connect, which is about teams. And then so many people asked if they could get certified in my models or roll out those models in their organizations that I now have training courses on my own work, and people can get certified and bring that training to their organization. Mm. And then I've also filmed courses for LinkedIn Learning and MadeCraft, and so you can find those on LinkedIn Learning as well as in Cornerstone On Demand now and Skillsoft. I also have some courses. And so if people search for my name in those places, they'll find me. The topics I tend to write about have to still do with with my own kind of research area. So I've got stuff on learning or or helping other people learn. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of stuff on being a great leader and bringing out the best in teams. And I've got a bunch of stuff on change, how we move effectively through change. Um, So I'm always kind of focusing on top business topics. I also have some stuff on innovation and creativity and some stuff on, um, you know, bringing out the potential in other folks. So those right. are kind of my main themes that I'm always focusing on. Gotcha. And Startup Nation, once again, you can check that out on the website. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access. Uh, Dr. B, I want to ask you about, you know, going back a little bit to when you talked about, you know, when uh, LinkedIn or lynda.com was kind of acquired by LinkedIn and it was turning to LinkedIn learning and stuff like that. Kind of talk about that transition and how that went for you. <laughs> well, okay. it was funny because LinkedIn was actually like a dream job I wanted, but I lived okay. in Santa Barbara and they were a Silicon Valley company. And right. so, you know, I walked in that morning and had no idea that the acquisition was happening and then was told, hey, congratulations, you've got a job now at LinkedIn. The rest of the HR team is is going to be laid off in 30 days, but oh, you wow. have a job and now you'll start reporting, you know, 500 miles away from here. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> so I had these mixed feelings of like being so excited and gotcha. yet sad at the same time. Mm. And then, you know, 
I'm certified in all of the change models that were out there. I teach change training. And, right. and during the next three months, you know, I was on this emotional roller coaster of some days feeling super excited and other days feeling really fearful and other days feeling really sad or angry. And I was, I kept saying, gosh, all the models that I know do not explain this. They don't make sense right now. Mm. So I had just finished the book on the brain science of learning. And I had no intention of continuing to write more books, but I was like, huh, I wonder what brain science says about going through change. So I started researching it. I guess that's kind of what I do. When I'm going through something stressful, I start researching. Gotcha. <laughs> um, but when I started finding out all this stuff around the biology of resistance and how our brain sees change as danger and how in the absence of information, our brain is wired to create the worst case scenario and then we worry about it. Um, it was explaining everything that I was going through. So that became the second book, Wired to Resist. Um, but it was a roller coaster. You know, it was a time of, of, of great opportunity and excitement. And at the same time, I was exhausted. You know, change is super exhausting. And learning new ways and, and integrating with new people is a whole change in your tribe. And, and your body has to do all this work to kind of orient itself to the new group of people you're with. Right. So, uh, you know, I was, I was living through it while trying to understand it. And um, ultimately, it was a great professional experience for me, but it was also really exhausting and eye-opening. And I, I felt like I learned a lot of valuable things that I've tried to share with others. I hear that. But let me ask a question to add a layer to that. Let's say, you know, you're a, a small business owner and you have a team of like, I don't know, let's say eight and somebody, and you decide to sell your company, but the company that's that's acquiring you wants you and your entire team to kind of come with you. As that leader, how do you? I mean, you know, you're probably going through all that you know stuff that you were just mentioning earlier, but now you have like eight other people to kind of kind of bring them along and and usher them all along with you. How do you, as the leader, kind of help manage those expectations with your team? You know, manage those emotions. Kind of talk about like I guess leading a team through a transition. I guess a great question and a lot of leaders are faced with that. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. This is true of any kind of change. So this is also, the, what I'm about to share is also true in the middle of a pandemic, for sure. example. So when humans are faced with change, they go through this series of emotions. And, and generally, we start off with fear and worry because our brain is wired to see change as potential danger. And it only really settles down once it gets enough information to know that it's not going to be bad. But essentially, we look for all the things we could lose or that could go wrong. And we just kind of have to go through that process. So yeah. a leader can be helpful by, first of all, being ready to just deal with negative emotions or, or people who are freaking out a little bit and gotcha. just continue to be calm and this nice, calm, steady presence. You can, you can listen to what people are worried about. Sometimes you can address their worries, but sometimes their worries are legitimate. You can't necessarily make promises. But what you can do is help them to keep look for what we, what we could gain. You know, why are we going through this change? What could we gain either personally or as a company or as a team from going through this together? Or what's the potential, you know, payoff at the end of this? And then part of it is just knowing that you know, even if you yourself are a mess, <laughs> you got you got to have a place to go process that with a peer of yours or a therapist or a coach. Right. Because every time you come to your team, you need to just be super calm. Remember those mirror neurons, they're going to pick up on our feelings and how we're doing. And then be prepared to be a broken record. You you will be surprised how much you need to keep re retelling them what you've already told them. Mm reorienting them to the goal, reminding them what's happening. Sounds like parenting. Um, yeah. You, I mean, you literally are just again and again. And then here's the kicker. Once it looks like they've gotten over the hump and they're finally embracing the change and looking forward to it, do not look away because they continue to need your guidance. And that's when most leaders make a mistake. They look away thinking, oh, they're fine. And the group can t quickly backslide. Mm -hmm. So you really just need to be that consistent, steady, calm presence all the way through. And that doesn't mean you're selling them a bill of goods. You're, you're being honest, right. but you're also just saying, hey, you know, they need to lean on your strength right now because everything feels scary to them. So that means you got to go use your resources so you do feel strong and calm. So I always think leaders need a therapist and a coach. They do different things. And I think 
every every good leader needs a therapist and a coach because inevitably your group will reflect back to you stuff that you need to work on. And if you've got that support team helping you work on it, you'll be in good shape. If you don't, then it's you can get in you can get into some stressful times yourself. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to Dr. Britt Andriata, the CEO of Seventh Mind. If you want to check out her website, we have that link there in the show notes for easy access. We also have a link for all of her books uh, there in the show notes as well. Definitely something you want to add and put in your uh, entrepreneurial toolkit. Dr. B, I want to ask you this. Can I just kind of get your commentary on something? Because, you know, we're talking about, you know, you're there, at, you know, with LinkedIn learning and stuff like that. And we're starting to see out, you know, in society that like barriers to learning things are kind of coming down. You're starting to see in education or in colleges, whether they're, you know, a, a lot of online schools, there's a lot of uh, places like a LinkedIn learning where you can learn like these things that you would traditionally learn in college, but you can learn it now online and things of that nature. You're starting to see colleges have like a, not just online courses, but also uh, you know, they're not, not necessarily considering ACT scores for, you know, uh, you know, for entry to schools and stuff like that. Just kind of give your commentary on education and the I guess the increased access to learning, I guess we're seeing in society right now. Great question. And just so you all know, I was a professor at the University of California for 20 years and a mm-hmm. dean of students. So I've definitely done the academic thing. So right. in in your question is the answer. There's a difference between education and learning. Mm, gotcha. Education is always set up to be a system where that system determines what are the requirements to demonstrate that you've successfully completed, whether it's a course or the major or the degree, K through 12, you know, you got your high school diploma because you successfully checked off all the boxes. Right. And education is a system you know, it's in need of an overhaul. <laughs> There's some things that are good about it. You know, essentially, it's like other people who have some knowledge or experience determine what, what you need to know in order to have a degree, and then they make sure you accomplish it at a certain level, think grades, before they certify you and put a stamp saying, yes, this person has achieved this level of knowledge and skill. And so education for the longest time was kind of how all the businesses trusted that system to say, you'll tell us when people have this level or skill and we'll take people with a college degree or a high school, high school diploma or certificate, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Then came along, you know, the computer changed everything. It was the advent of the computer and particularly the internet where then that whole process got disrupted and you had things like lynda.com. Lynda.com was one of the first online learning companies. Right. And we, you know, we all of a sudden that gatekeeper was gone. And so people could come and learn from us and take individual courses and build up their own set of knowledge. You know, and before that, people could do that on your own. I've seen people who never earned a degree be super hungry learners and read a ton of stuff and learned a ton of stuff because right. they were always so curious. So, you know, lifelong learners and people who are curious have always kind of done this. But now there's so many learning companies that that learning – and learning a new skill or a new piece of information, really the gate, the gatekeeping is gone. You can access right. things from experts all over the world. Some of it you pay for, some of it's free. You have to be careful now, though, because some of that gatekeeping means you could be taking a YouTube you know, video from someone who really doesn't know what they're doing and mm. is selling you a bill of goods, right? right? So there, there's a little bit of testing you need to do, but... I love it. I mean, I love that it's allowed people to learn all over the world at their own pace and have access to subject matter experts all over the place. It is now muddying the waters. What does it mean to have a college degree? Is a college degree really required? Particularly because of technology, the shelf life for most professional skills these days is less than five years. Mm. You know, things are changing that fast. So even if you do do the college thing, and I did, I got a PhD, um, you know, that information becomes obsolete. So no matter what, all of us need to be lifelong learners. And then hopefully we end up at companies who believe in learning and give us lots of opportunities to learn and grow and support us in that. It is the number, you know, it's one of the top three things people look for in a job now is opportunities to learn and grow. And it's one of the top three reasons people leave a company is that they don't have opportunities to learn and grow. So we are a species that hungers to learn and grow. And now you just want to make choices so that you end up in the environment where you're best supported in whatever that looks like for you. 
and it might be different for you, Dominic, than what it looks like for me. Right. We all got to find the place that's our match so that we're in the right kind of environment to help us grow and, and reach our potential. Right. You, you know, and I appreciate you sharing that. I think one of the things that I, well, there's two things I, I like about this is because one, like maybe I'm interested in something, but I don't necessarily have $3,000 to pay for a course. You know what I mean? So it, like uh, some of yeah. these things are kind of like allowing me to kind of, not necessarily it gives you the full course, but at the very least it, it gets you your foot in the door to just kind of check it out to kind of explore and see if you like it and stuff like that. And also I think the second reason I kind of like it is because, you know, uh, th- there's an issue with like income inequality. And I think education is the great equalizer to that. And so as uh, broadband, you know, costs become a little bit, you know, cheaper, uh, internet access becomes a little bit more available. And now you have, uh, you know, uh, like a LinkedIn learning to kind of help with uh, that, you know, access to education and learning stuff like that. I think it just can be a great example to, you know, opening up the doors to people who may not have had that opportunity, you know, beforehand. What do you think? Hello? Yes. Sorry. Oh, uh, can no you repeat the question? It got a little fuzzy and I think I, I think I caught the essence of it, but can you just say it one more time. Oh, no, I, I was just saying that I, I like the fact that, you know, a it kind of like lowers the, the barrier of entry to education for people who may not have had like, you know, the money to kind of play around with coding to see if they liked it or uh, and things like that. I guess I was just saying I like it for that reason that we are, we're having uh, uh, all these uh, per- these uh, access to learning points like a LinkedIn learning. So that way, people who normally wouldn't have that opportunity can now have the opportunity to see if they like coding to see if they want to go into management or leadership or something like that. So I guess I'm just saying I think that's a good thing. And I'm just asking, what do you think? Yes, I absolutely like that it's broken those access barriers, mm-hmm. right? It's made access to learning. And even for, you know, within companies, it used to be the case, well, st- sadly, it's still true, mm-hmm. that some companies will cherry pick who gets access to management training mm-hmm. or who right. gets access to leadership training, right? But now, it, even if you're not picked within your company to do that, you can go do that for yourself. You can go find things and develop yourself. The only caution I would give people is that, you know, if you took a, a coding course or a leadership course in college, it would unfold over 10 weeks or 12 weeks or whatever, and you'd have assignments that would you would have to practice. You'd right. have to learn. You'd have to take some tests, and you'd have to be forced to demonstrate your level of retaining that information, and you'd either get a passing grade or, you know, whatever. When you take some online courses, particularly the video-based ones where you earn the certificate by watching the videos – you know, you can you can finish the videos and not have really taken in anything. Right. So, you know, I, I wouldn't hire a coder who had a certificate saying that they completed a few video based courses because I don't know if they've actually learned anything. That makes sense. I'd still be looking for them to demonstrate their level of knowledge and skill. So that's one thing to just be careful of is if you're if you're going to these different sources to earn badges or certificates make sure that those badges or certificates are valued by the people who do the hiring and, and think about how you can continue to demonstrate what you're learning, whether it's creating a portfolio for yourself or just knowing that eventually you have to, you have to code. Right, of <laughs> you, course. Better, you better practice so that you actually can do the thing at the end of it, not just have said, Oh, I sat through a bunch of things and listened, but I, I don't really know how to do it. For sure. You know, let, let me ask a, a quick follow up because, you know, right now when we kind of talked about this offline here, you know, we're, a lot of us are kind of doing the at home virtual learning and, and stuff like that. And it seems like before COVID, we were kind of going into that direction. A lot of people who were doing kind of the homeschool model were kind of doing the home, like the virtual learning where they, they pay a, a company and they have the assignments via online and stuff like that. But now due to COVID, a lot of school systems and traditional school districts are kind of doing this either the tra- all the way virtual or they're doing a hybrid model. Uh, after we come out of this pandemic, what do you see the state of education when it comes to the virtual or back to traditional schools? What, what's your commentary on that, Dr. B? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, and at the beginning, at the beginning, I was a little worried mm. because 
while it was great that this was forcing, you know, for example, I work with lots of organizations and right. some have embraced online learning a long time ago and others were really resistant to it. They didn't believe someone could work from home and still do a good job or they didn't think you could learn online. Right. So the good news is this pandemic forced all the resistors past that barrier. They mm. had to do it. And on the other side, they're like, oh, this, some of the stuff actually works. At first, I was worried that they'd be like, oh, well, then we should never have in-person learning again. Let's just it's cheaper, you know, it's cheaper, it's more scalable, all this stuff. But we've now been in this pandemic long enough that we can also see that it does not replace in-person learning or in-person learning has so many other pieces that it brings to the table or working in a cohort or whatever that some people are now <clears throat> seeing what is lost too. Right. The ultimate best learning strategy is a blend. And that you figure out what piece of knowledge or what skill am I trying the learner to develop, get the learner to develop, and then you match the learning modality to what's the most effective. Mm. For some things, self-paced online is the most effective. And for others, that's not going to accomplish all the goals you have, like manager training, for example. You also need the networking that happens when managers come together and the culture building that happens in the organization when they're talking to each other. Right. And you also need to have the ability to be in the room and see, you know, have them practice in the room with real humans. The thing about looking at a screen is that our body knows we're not really with that person. First of all, they're only two inches tall, <laughs> and we know that humans are not two inches tall. Right. Second of all, they're 2D instead of 3D, and our brain knows that. And then while we're looking at the screen, the peripheral vision picks up that we're sitting in our living room. So it knows that we're not really with those people. Um, virtual reality, on the other hand, where you put on a headset and you can turn your head left and right and see all these things, it is so immersive that the brain actually takes in VR experiences and codes them as actual memories. Like mm. they take it in as real experiences and they go into the brain as a, as a lived memory. So virtual reality is super powerful because it tricks the brain into thinking you are really there doing those things. But when we're talking through a laptop screen, we know we're not. So ultimately I think the future of learning is that uh, it's good that we push people through their resistance People now know that, you know, change fatigue is real. Zoom fatigue is real. Right. We hunger to be together and we'll come back. We may overbalance at first, but of ultimately I think we're going to find this nice middle point, which is where we start to use the learning modality to best serve those learning goals and not just do one versus another because it's cheaper the way we've always done it or whatever. So it's, it's really about what's the most effective way to bring about the, the behavior change you're going after, not the thing with the pretty bells and whistles or the thing that you've always done. I hear that. It's, it's one thing we always try to preach on this show is, is, is achieving balance. And so that's definitely uh, something you just kind of iterated there for sure. Uh, cause I think that's the best route for sure. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and before we kind of wrap up for today, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Dr. Britt, uh, Andriata, you, we, you've gave amazing value and it gave amazing, uh, content that we can all definitely put in our entrepreneurial toolkit and, and, and go forward on our path to entrepreneurship. I just want to ask you two more questions and then I want to let you go, uh, for okay. sure. Uh, uh, I know that you work with, you know, nonprofit organizations, the YMCA, but one of them you also work with is the Prison Fellowship Ward and Exchange Program. And that's one thing that uh, we here at the Startup Life uh, are very uh, fierce advocates for is kind of ending recidivism and and giving people who, who made a mistake uh, another chance. Just kind of talk about your work there and why that work was important with you to work with them. Oh, great question. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, what's so interesting is that our society, particularly politicians, if you think about it, you know, how we view the justice system is oftentimes framed through politicians and their run for office. And right. then they're tweaking, they're tweaking these messages um, and our fear around these messages in certain ways. I mean, we're living through it right now. So mm -hmm. uh, we all have real live examples. But the reality is that most people in prison have committed nonviolent crimes and most of them will be your neighbor again. Right. And so we need to invest in people. These are, our, these are our friends and our family and our sisters and our brothers and our, 
our former teachers and all of that kind of stuff. And so really, you know, prison is meant to be a place where you, you pay the consequences for a choice you made. And yet you're supposed to complete that sentence, whatever it was, and you've done your time and you're welcome back to society. The problem is that once people have gone through that, oftentimes that they're ostracized and shamed for so long that they don't have access to the same jobs, et cetera. And yet they're, you know, (laughs) <laughs> there are our neighbors and our friends and all this kind of stuff. So we need to have a different dialogue about it. I was brought in to work with this, um, the prison fellowship because of all the work they're doing in prisons. They're doing amazing work. And particularly this warden exchange program is their leadership development program. So every year they run a new court cohort of prison wardens from around the country and we take them through a nine month leadership development program, giving them real skills and behavior change and all that kind of stuff to bring about real change in their systems. And I have to say, I have, I went in with some pre, you know, some misconceptions about prison wardens. I thought that a lot of them came from kind of the command and control background, but it turns out a lot of them really kind of come more from a a social worker perspective. Like Mm. they really, really care deeply about their residents or their inmates. They really, really care deeply about recidivism and getting people back on track for a healthy life. And oftentimes they're dealing with really difficult circumstances. And when they try to invest in people's potential, for example, they try to bring a mindfulness class to the prison We all know that mindfulness is a powerful, powerful tool that can help people with anger management and managing all kinds of emotions and becoming healthier and more resilient. People will protest that, saying prisoners don't deserve that. No money should be spent on that. They should be punished. And yet at the same time, if you don't give this population the skills and the tools they need to achieve their potential to become better, then we're really just shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, as a society, we are not helping the very people who will move back into our neighborhood become better. And so I've been just so impressed with how much prison wardens care and how hard they have to work and how, how many challenges they face. And so doing leadership development with that community has been super, super meaningful to me. It's, it's, one, it's something that I donate my time to every year. And um, I just really encourage people to learn more about our prison system and learn more about uh, a lot of misconceptions you've been fed about what's going on in our justice system. And I think, you know, the recent stuff with George Floyd and, and police brutality and systemic oppression in all of these systems. Right. These are really important conversations for us all to be having. They're uncomfortable and they're going to challenge some of our worldviews, but we really, really need to have these conversations and we really need to challenge the way some of the misinformation we've been given. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate you uh, sharing all of that. And that was very thoughtful. I appreciate you sharing that. My dad was is a correction officer, has been for almost 30 years now. And so uh, you, you talked about having those misconceptions and stuff like that. I had those too. And after I had a conversation with him, you know, he, he kind of approaches his job uh, from that kind of social worker aspect that you talked about as well. So he kind of uh, changed my mind, is which is why I, uh, uh, that's something that's important to me to kind of uh, help where I can as far as like, you know, people who've who've made a mistake in society and, and they're trying to get back. I, I just believe that everybody deserves a path back. You know, everybody deserves a path back, especially if you want one. So I appreciate you sharing all of that. Absolutely. And if we really look at prisons today, a lot of prisons are really a reflection of how we're not doing a good job with mental health right. and we're not doing a, jo- a great job with um addiction issues. And if we were to do a better job helping people with those two issues, our prisons would hardly, you know, would hardly have anybody in them. Like that's really the source of most of our, you know, a lot of, uh, it's the background behind a lot of crimes or a lot of reason why people are in jail. For sure. For sure. Thank you uh, for sharing that. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to you because this is the part of the show where, you know, given with everything going on, you know, people feel a little down, feel a little discouraged. If you would, uh, Dr. Andriotti, just give us some words of encouragement to take us out for today, if you don't mind. <laughs> Happy to. You know, we will get through this. What I can tell you about the human species is we are incredibly resilient and we are incredibly adaptive. And this is hard right now. So I just want to acknowledge if you're feeling tired and, and you've been 
you know, using your surge capacity for the last few months, absolutely. You're probably hitting the wall and you're, you're exhausted. So take care of yourself. You have permission to take care of yourself. It's important to take your weekends. It's important to let a little joy in your life. It's important to stay connected to people that you love and who love you. And then just know in the long, the long picture here, we will get through this. We're going to adapt. We're going to come out with new ways of doing things. We will be stronger on the other end. But that doesn't mean it's not a little bumpy as we go through it. And so I can't promise you that we, we won't have some rough patches. We've already had a few. We'll have some more. Um, but what I know is that humans find a way and that we deeply care about each other. The truth of human nature is we're empath- empathetic and we, we care about each other. And as long as we keep focusing on that and taking care of ourselves, we will get through this and we will be stronger and better for it. So just breathe and know that we will eventually come out in, in good shape. I hear that. Thank you so much. And that's going to wrap up this session of the Startup Life. We want to once again thank Dr. Britt Andriata for coming on the show here on the Startup Life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dominic. It's been wonderful talking to you, and I'm so excited to connect with your followers, and I hope they will look me up on LinkedIn and, and on my website. Where you, and thank you for putting all those links on your um, show notes. I really appreciate it. For sure. And once again, Startup Nation, just like you said, all those links, that website, LinkedIn, uh, credentials, uh, how to buy the book, all that is there in the show notes. And as always, Startup Nation, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.